Hey gamers, what's up? In my previous videos I desperately wanted to make this game to run on the TAR 2600. My progress was slow and I had only this to show. Oh no, 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 no not this. This. So you might ask what changes have been made since then. Well, there's a lot of them. The first task was to deal with the memory shortage. I was not managing the memory wisely. And also the 2600 had only 128 bytes of RAM in total. I've created a lot of variables and arrays that by now kinda seem dumb and unnecessary. For instance, I had an extra row for each of the screen map rows just because I thought I would make boulders from 3 on 2 playfield blocks. But it kinda seems stupid now, since they would probably be of the same color as the rest of the playfield. So now I got rid of the extra rows and gained some sweet free 36 bytes of memory. It might seem like not much to you, but for me this amount of memory is huge. Since now I had some free bytes, I could store the ladder X coordinates to them. I needed to figure out how to properly position and store all the six ladders. I knew I will be drawing them using the player 2 sprite. And yeah, you can place multiple instances of the same sprite on different scanlines. But you need to do that while the frame is being drawn on the screen. I needed some practice and for that I tried to draw a fake score and player lives below. It is crazy when you think how much you can do with just two player sprites. You won't believe that graphics in the Space Invaders game are drawn mostly with them. If you turn on the TIA debugging in the Stella emulator, you can see how it works. The player 1 sprite is dark red and the player 2 is yellow. The sprites have setting registers where you can specify how many times you want to repeat that sprite and what distance should be between the clones. You can even double or quadruple the size of the player sprite. For instance, in order to draw the score and the player lives, I tripled player 1 and player 2 sprites and drew them one after another. In order to tweak the distances between the sprites, you need to move them a bit horizontally. Oh yeah, the scary horizontal sprite movement. Oh my God! I think I have a better understanding how it works by now. So as I mentioned in my first video, in order to move the sprite on the x-axis, you have to write to the reset register of the sprite at a certain point during the scanline. But by doing just that, you will place the sprite very roughly. To fine-tune the position, you need to place a value ranging from minus 8 to 7 to a horizontal movement register. Also, you need to put STH move after the wait for the sync in order for the fine horizontal movement to work. Although, if you do that, STH move will create some interesting artifacts on the scan lines on the left side of the screen. It is very noticeable if your background is light. Activision did a workaround for this and made a black bar on the left side of the screen. So these artifacts won't be seen. You can actually do that by calling H move in every scan line. Like I did that where the lives are drawn. But mostly I don't need to worry about this much since my background is black anyway. But as you know, official Atari had a rule that you can use black background only if your game is set in space. Also, each move might affect other sprites and distort them. To cancel that, you can write to the horizontal movement clear register and it will clear all the movements. It's basically the same as writing zero to all the horizontal movement registers. So let's place those ladders already. I borrowed this simple random number code that generates 8-bit number by constantly shifting bits to the right of a variable in memory. Once you reach the bit zero, it adds some kind of magic number and that's basically it. And because of this, the Random values are always the same when you first start the game. 
Placing the ladders was still a bit hard, since you don't have enough CPU cycles to move your sprite where you want. It's simply impossible to draw something on a scan line and also do the horizontal movement. To move the sprite to the far right of the screen takes all the time that could be used to draw a scan line. So I had to sacrifice a scan line at the end of each map tile row. Now each map row is very prominent and even that was not enough. I had to use this clever lookup table to save some additional CPU cycles. Finally I had the ladders where they're supposed to be. So how about drawing some lava? Normally you can set only one color for the whole playfield. How do I draw the red map tiles then? My first idea was just to draw the tiles of different color on different frames. To draw ground tiles in one frame and lava tiles in another. I assumed it won't look good on the emulator, but it would definitely be an AOK -okay on a CRT TV. Unfortunately, the result was the opposite. It looked fine on the emulator, especially when you turn the phosphor option on. But on my TV it was blinking like crazy. If I was turning my head sideways, I could even see the black gaps where the tiles of different colors should be. I guess if I get drunk or squint my eyes really hard, then I could pretend the screen is not blinking. But no, I need to find a better solution for this. So the next option was to draw different types of tiles on different scan lines. You draw a scan line with the yellow blocks and then you draw one with the red. The problem with this were the sprites. My bloated sprite drawing code could not simply fit with the playfield's drawing code on the same scan line. Also to draw different color tiles on the same frame would require additional 36 bytes of RAM. Plus I had even more serious problem. I have filled vertical blank and overscan periods to the brim with instructions and there were no time left to execute more code. I was even unable to properly check the collision for moving downwards. Now what? Let's say I could ditch the logics map that takes 36 bytes. If I could get rid of the logics map, I would no longer need for that stupid code that constantly updates the screen map and hogs all the vertical blank cycles. But I would need to implement the hardware based collision detection that I disliked so much in the previous video. And also I would need to work directly with the cumbersome screen map, for instance when I destroy the blocks by mining. But did I have other choice? Not really. So I started with the hardware based collision detection. It actually didn't seem that bad when I gave it another chance. You just have to fall back to a previous position when the collision is detected. Seems easy, right? But wait until you turn on the animations. If you switch to an animation frame where you swing your arms and you are near a wall, that's it, you're stuck. My solution was not only to revert the position during the collision, but also to revert the sprite's frame. Now I can do all these weird things. The horizontal sprite flipping was the worst, since my dude in the sprite is not centered. It kinda pushes the character graphics in opposite direction when you flip the sprite, and instantly you get stuck in a wall. Sure, you could not flip and always moonwalk, but I chose to set a frame without protruding appendages when I flip the sprite. Also to move it a few pixels to the direction I am flipping to. And it worked great. So the next step was to rewrite the mining code so that instead of checking the logics map, I would need to check the screen map. For that I created two lookup tables in the ROM. One contains a byte offset of the screen map column depending on which X cell you want to mine. The other table contains a pattern that could be set to the column element with the end instruction. So technically I can go nuts and destroy even smaller 
playfield pieces, but I decided to stick to three playfield blocks. And that was it, I could finally delete the logics map and free up another 36 bytes of RAM. So I was ready to implement the lava drawing. Was I? I thought to myself, perhaps I should not start toying with lava yet, but instead I should implement the basic gameplay mechanics. I started to mess around with the fake score and try to make it less fake, so you could actually increase it by mining blocks. By default the score is supposed to be just a triple copy of the player 1 and player 2 sprites. It's not that simple to attach 6 different pictures to them, in this case digits. As with the asymmetric playfield you have to assign the graphics to the sprites at a very specific time. You even need to enable vertical delay for each sprite. The vertical delay actually delays the registers of the sprites and also turns on the shadow registers. But with all this I was still having a hard time for some reason. It was not enough CPU cycles to read the graphics data from the pointers and feed it to the sprite registers. At the end I managed to make that it would be possible to change all five numbers except the last one. So I left it as zero. Also there were no CPU cycles left to use for the H move. So I could not position the digits more evenly. But at least they work now. Then I made that when you reach the bottom right corner of the map, the game is restarted. Obviously it would be a good idea to place some kind of object there, so you could see it as your goal. But unfortunately my drawing code had no free CPU cycles to do that. So I added a simple check if the player reaches the position. I have no idea why I did that, but instead of calling a normal subroutine when the destination is reached, I tried to call a label which pointed where the new map is generated and there was no return statement. The stack kept growing with each call to this subroutine. By going through several levels, I could experience how the data could be corrupted by the stack. So now I can go through rooms and collect points. What about the hazard? Since I'm not ready to draw the lava yet, maybe I could simulate it with something else. How about the ball sprite? Normally you can't assign any graphics to it contrary to the player sprites. You can only change its width for the scan line. So you can make it appear as a ball if you have enough CPU cycles of course. At first I created this death ray by just writing random width and enabling the ball sprite. And I made it move from one side of the screen to the other. The problem with this death ray is that it is impossible to avoid it. So I needed to control its height somehow. Unfortunately for that I needed to add a check in my drawing code where I could disable the ball if a certain scanline is reached. And that was a huge challenge in fact, because as I said there were no free CPU cycles in my drawer code to add that check. Or so I thought. So how can I free up some cycles? While reading about the assembly instructions, I've learned that when you load a zero value to a register, you don't necessarily need to check it with compare instruction to know if that value is a zero. You can use BEQ instantly. That actually helped me to save some cycles. Also I've pushed several lines of code to the playfield drawing code where I had NLP instructions before. As a final optimization I created an array in RAM to copy the graphics data from ROM that the sprite animation pointer was pointing to. It saved only one CPU cycle though, but that was exactly what I needed. It might seem like an endless suffering on a crappy system. But you know what? This is fun. You might not realize how rewarding all this is when you think something is impossible, but after spending half of a day struggling and thinking about it, you finally find a way out. And that is an amazing feeling. So with all this so-called 
optimizations, I could finally limit the height of the ball sprite. Now I've got the beam that hangs from the top of the screen, moves from left to the right and constantly grows. Now all I need to do is to check player sprite's collision with this beam. Luckily the player sprite's collision with the ball was in the same register as the player sprite's collision with the playfield. So I just added a couple of instructions and boom! I could finally die in my game. So now I have the basic gameplay mechanics. I can progress by racking up the score and I can be defeated. You can finally call it a game. By all means it's not a great game yet, but it's definitely a game now. At this point you might think that's it, the game is finished. But I know it's just the beginning. There is still tons of things to do. I don't have normal looking lava yet. This growing ding dong might do for now, but it needs to be replaced. Plus its movement is not what I want. Also I need better ladder generation. Because sometimes they all get the same X coordinate for some reason. And you still can horribly stuck in a corner of a wall when you try to descend a ladder. And the sounds. I have none. Imagine that. Will I ever be able to achieve all that? How the future iterations of my game will look? And yeah, you guessed it. You will find out if you watch my upcoming videos. So subscribe. Meanwhile, you can check my git repository where you can find the code and the latest ROM. The link is in the description. So thanks for watching and see you next time. Bye.